All right, welcome everyone to Mapping the 50 with Cody Townsend. Um, today we're going to be going over one of um, the classic 50 ski descents and getting a little bit of insight into uh, how Cody looks at pretty advanced terrain and, and how he looks at, you know, how to plan a route, how to plan around the logistics and the avalanche danger. And, um, and well, I think the, the main thing too is what we're going to be showing is being how to use the tools of Onyx to almost accelerate the process of what I've done over the years before some of these tools existed. You usually are relying on local beta, um, kind of just general knowledge and experience, but some of these like tools that are coming out there kind of kind of accelerate your education process into making decisions and route planning in general. So like going through some of the the newest features of Onyx, I, I look at it now almost going like, oh yeah, that's why we made that decision to go at this time of day because talking to locals have been living there for 20 years, they know this is a very uh, dangerous slide path you have to cross under. So um, I think we'll be talking about that, specifically one line from the 50 and showing how these tools can kind of educate you even faster than the way I've learned, which is generally through experience. Yeah, that's a good point. Like my experience with like getting into the backcountry was you know, there weren't really any catered tools specifically built for backcountry schemes. You'd use like Google Earth and you'd use like a bunch of other things and you'd rely on local beta um, where now there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of things that you can do with these tools to bring those decisions back into your own hands and to make sure that you're like looking around a lot of the corners before you head out into the backcountry. Um, cool. Well, we'll start with introductions. I'm Matt Madick. Um, I am a marketing manager on the Onyx backcountry team. And I live in Carbondale, Colorado. I've been split boarding for a handful of years now and just really love getting out and, you know, exploring and seeing where else I can go on my split board. And then this man needs no introduction, but so happy to be joined by Cody Townsend today. Um, star of the 50 Project, father, um, and a skier that I think a lot of us look up to. So thanks for joining us. And I'm really excited to get like a little bit of insight into your mind and these crazy missions that you have in front of you. So, <laughs> um, and I want to start this off with a disclaimer. Um, this is not an avalanche class. Cody and I are not certified avalanche guides and instructors. So what you're hearing from us is, is just firsthand knowledge from, you know, people who like to get out and get after it. But I urge you to get professional education. I earn you to gain your experience safely. And I urge you to get comfortable with your gear on your own time and go beyond this class. Um, for this. So. so what's on the docket for today? Um, we just did our intros. We got a little bit more going in that front. Uh, we're going to go over some of the new features and the new stuff that we have coming for Onyx Backcountry that you may not be aware of. Uh, then we're going to go through a demo where we're going to break down one of the lines in the 50 project. We're going to go over how to make your phone ready for its use in the field when you're out of service. And then we're doing a giveaway and Q&A at the end. So if you have great questions, um, you know, start putting them in the chat or start saving them for later um, and we'll go through them all. So we have a really awesome sale going on right now. It's called the Too Good To Be True sale. A uh, premium membership is $5 when it's normally 30 and an elite membership is $30 when it's normally $100. So if you're not an Onyx Backcountry member, this is probably the best time we're ever gonna have to get on board and to get the app. There's also a free trial option on this landing page as well. And um, Lance, if you could throw the link to this in the chat, just so if people aren't on their phones, um, they can get into there. That would be great. Um, best of all with this sales, we're donating a portion of the proceeds to Outdoor Alliance, um, which I'm really excited about as well. So if you've been thinking about Onyx and you haven't reused it yet, like now is a really good time to get in and check it out. And then on that same page, which I'll showcase on this next slide, we're doing also, a really cool- it's also Sorry. being December 21st, really good last minute Christmas gift for somebody. They don't need to know you spent $5 for it. Yeah, you just got to, when you do it, create it under their email address. So that way, exactly. you can directly to them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, as a result like of this webinar, um, thanks Mammut. Um, we are giving away a Avalanche, a Mammut Pro 35 removable airbag Avalanche backpack. Um, so on that same page that I just sent earlier with the signup page, uh, there's a form that you must log into your Onyx account when you go to the bottom. 
And once you're in there, it'll reveal the form and you can enter your information in there. And um, yeah, um, Lance, can you put the other URL in there? It's the masterclass one instead that I sent you on Slack. Because that one actually has the giveaway. Or I'll put it in there. Okay, sorry about that, y'all. There it is. Yeah, so that one, the QR code doesn't work. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, well, get uh, Gal, there's a link right there. Do the one that says onyxmaps.com slash backcountry slash masterclass. Um, so yeah, we're giving away a backpack. Um, yeah, so you just have to log into an Onyx account. If you don't have one, there's a place you can set it up. You don't even need a paid account. If you just want to like create a free account, you can also get in there and log in. And we'll show this at the end of the presentation as well. Okay. And then, yeah, if we have any other issues of getting in here, we can, we'll do it for the drawing. So don't worry. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just gonna go over a handful of things that are new in Onyx Backcountry. So one of the things we're on a great mission to add more of is our guidebooks. And we are, our process for getting guidebook data is a little bit different than some of our um, competitors, right? So we're um, we're at, working with closely with Beacon Guidebooks and other reputable guidebook authors to integrate digital guidebooks written by avalanche professionals and guides and people who know these areas really well um, versus relying on like crowdsourced um, or user generated content for our backcountry ski lines. And I think this is really valuable for us because we can provide really great experiences in select areas, especially the ones that get a lot of traffic. So um, that's our philosophy behind that. And we integrate all of this content with snowtail stations, avalanche reports, um, and other things to make the experience more dynamic. And, you know, pulling in those real-time condition reports so you can actually see, you know, real-time, like, what's going on in the zones before you actually get out there. So we've added, yeah. I want to add to that, like, um, it's a big differentiator between other potential apps, and I don't necessarily want to, like, put down anyone else, but not having user-generated um lines and routes going into a very public forum, I think is a safety issue. And we've had this discussion with Onyx years ago, of uh, whether to include that. But um, I saw an incident uh, that didn't result in an actual incident, but from using uh, another sponsored athlete that was sponsored by another um, mapping company, follow a track that put them under really dangerous overhead exposure as well as on a cornice and it was kind of a white out style day not the best visibility and we saw their tracks going into a zone that did not you do not tour there but someone else had done that and it set the route so uh it's one of these things that differentiates between onyx is using reputable sources for putting in route information line information and we've even talked about it of being like you as a as a user of this still need to be making your own decisions and not just following essentially a line through the backcountry. So um, this is one of those things that like it's made it slower to get route information, but it's much more reliable. One of the one of the reasons why I really um, I've cho chosen to use Onyx over other sources. Yeah, thanks, Cody. Yeah, and I think that's that's definitely one of our approaches as well as giving you you know, some information with here, but then also giving you a full suite of tools to like plan your own routes, you know, and if, if they're not in our app, you can still use our app to, to plan a safe tour and, and to know what you're getting yourself into. So some of the new guidebooks we've recently added um, since last winter have been one for Mount Hood, um, the Light Tours of Tahoe book, Taos in Santa Fe, and then Marble, Colorado. Um, and Cody, Cody actually wrote the forward for the Light Tours of Colorado book. So that was a good one. And then coming soon, we have content coming in Vail Pass, Monarch Pass. We have some additional lines coming out in Crested Butte, um, the Indian Peaks, James Peak Wilderness, the Wasatch, and then Cali Backcountry Skiing, California's Eastern Sierras, and then Peaks of Coolars of so Southwest Montana. So we're continuously on the hunt for new, um, for new people or for new areas to um, explore and for new guidebook authors to partner with. All right. So one other thing that we've recently added to the app is um, climbing, a climbing activity mode and a mountain bike activity mode. Um, so Onyx in 2020, um, 2021, 
I think. Yeah. <laughs> Acquired uh, mountain project, mountain bike project, and some of those other sites. So we've been slowly ingesting some of the content into our app and creating a new experience using our awesome maps and creating more purpose-built stuff for other activities besides backcountry skiing. So I'm really excited about that. And one of the benefits of that is like, if you get really good at using Onyx Backcountry for playing your tour, you can start using it all year for all of your other hobbies and camping and everything else. So I'm excited about that. And then the one I think myself and I think Cody as well is really excited about is our avalanche terrain exposure scale layers. So this is something that we've been working on for a while and have really, you know, pushed forward with building this new layer that I think is going to really change how we all talk about avalanche terrain. So a little bit of context on eights. Um, eights is a scale used to categorize the severity of avalanche exposure strictly based on the landscape, regardless of the snowpack conditions. So this is a layer that will alert you to the terrain. Um, let's say it snows a foot overnight. The layer actually doesn't dynamically update with like the current conditions, but it's more representative of the terrain if if there's the potential for avalanches um, and stuff like that. So we'll go a lot more into detail about that as we go through here as well. Um, and we'll show you some really good practical use cases that everybody can use. Um, so why was AIDS created? In 2003, there was a um, Calgary private school trip um, that was on, in Glacier National Park, and they were hit from an avalanche. Um, they were engulfed in an avalanche from an overhead hazard, and seven students perished in that avalanche fatality. So in the following months, Parks Canada, um, Parks Canada's Backcountry Avalanche Risk Review worked to find a path forward to determine how to prevent similar incidents uh, such as this. And how has AIDS been implemented? So AIDS has actually been in use in Canada since 2005, where they developed um, the eight scale, and it basically built the framework to evaluate, describe, and communicate the complexities of avalanche train exposure. And up until this point, um, with this new layer that we have created, the eights work has all been manually done. They would look at really popular areas, and they would send guides out, and they would hand draw maps using the different inputs and the different train classifications. And where Onyx comes in is that we created what we call auto eights, which is a, a an algorithmic layer that uses all those different parameters and assigns classification at scale. So the beauty of this is that, you know, eights traditionally has been very labor intensive and cost intensive to roll out to everywhere at scale. And by having a computer model that can do it for us, we stand the chance to like, really expand the coverage for this and to kind of create a new way that we talk about, you know, avalanche train exposure. Um, the caveat with that, especially this year, is that we have created this computer model, but we want to base our model in reality. So all of the areas that we currently have AIDS coverage for have been looked over by avalanche professionals across the country, and they've been refined based on what they've experienced in these areas um, because they know them so well. So we're using this as a way to really like confirm that what our computer model is showing is correct and make sure that there's no tweaks or oversights that we have to make our model better moving forward. Um, so, oh, sorry. <laughs> so I have a, a handful of terrain classifications. I'm actually gonna drop this in the link in the chat for future conversations, but there's four different classifications of avalanche train exposure. Um, you know, actually, I'm going to jump into this now. I think it'll be important to go over. Sweet. So I built this little cool tool that shows a different terrain. So we have we have a handful of classifications for it. So it's eights one through four. So the first one you want to look at is eights terrain simple, um, which is defined as exposure to low angle primarily forested terrain. Some forest openings may involve the runout zones of infrequent avalanches and may exist. But in the simple terrain, there's many options to reduce or eliminate exposure. And that's what you see here. Like this is a fairly flat area. There's no overhead hazards. Um, and you're fairly out of avalanche danger in this area. The next layer up is challenging. So challenging terrain is exposure to well-defined avalanche paths and starting zones, terrain traps, or overhead hazard. Options exist to reduce or eliminate exposure with careful route finding. So you can see here, like this, this layer right here is the blue section right here. And that shows a, an example of challenging terrain. The next is complex terrain. 
which is exposure to multiple overlapping avalanche paths or large expanses of steep open terrain, sustained exposure to overhead hazard, many avalanche starting zones and terrain traps with minimal options to reduce exposure. And then your last classification is your extreme terrain, which is exposure to very steep faces with cliffs, um, spines, couloirs, crevasses, sustained overhead haption. And there's no options to reduce and exposure to even small avalanches can be fatal. Um, cool. So the next question is where do we have coverage with our new eights layer and you know the localization that we've been working with avalanche centers for. So currently in the app, we have Crested Butte, Marble, Aspen, Berthed Pass, Loveland Pass, Montezuma, Silverton, Eastern Rocky Mountain National Park, the Mosquito Range, and Eastvale Pass. Um, we also have in Montana, the Bridgers, North Galtons, the Northern Madisons, the Southern Madisons, and Cook City. And in the Wasatch, we have um, a lot of like the norm, like the um, the Salt Lake, Logan, Ogden, Ogden, and Provo areas. And then we're working right now to validate additional zones in Washington, California, Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, and Alaska as soon as we can. So those are the areas in which we have AIDS coverage. All right. So now we're going to move into the Onyx Backcountry demo where we walk through one of the 50 classic ski descents of North America. Um, Cody, do you want to kick it off with the grand the grand reveal of what we're going to be talking about today? Yeah, we're going to be talking about a, a line that I think is titled in my YouTube um, series as one of the most challenging lines in Colorado. Um, it's a line that was skied first. Uh, God, I actually forget the year it was, but uh, it was almost 20 years between first and second descent. Um, it is a line out of the Aspen area in the Elks Range called the Landry Line off of Pyramid Peak. Um, and now having skied it, um, I can say it is as rad and badass of a line as it comes. It was the closest to an Alaskan spine line that I've found in Colorado. Um, you don't kind of expect steep skiing in Colorado because of the general snowpack, but that line for some reason holds snow on pitches that are, you know, over 55 degrees. Um, it is an incredible line. Uh, it's an incredible day. And it's crazy that it's like just in the backyard of Aspen. Yeah, it's cool because I, I can see it sometimes and I'm poking around in my neighborhood and every time you see it, like, especially from that angle, it's, it is very intimidating looking. So, um, totally. really excited to break through like a pretty extreme use case of our app right now. Um, so again, like if you're getting into backcountry skiing, this is, this isn't going to be one to jump right into. In fact, like I personally don't feel like my risk tolerance is there right now to attempt this line, but it's going to be a great use case. And we're going to be able to walk through like a handful of you know, features and, and different things to consider that everybody can take advantage of here. So, so I will say um, in a weird sort of way, it was the very first backcountry ski line I've ever skied in Colorado um, because I've generally just not got to spend that much time in Colorado. So my first line ever was the Landry line, which was good because then I could just work downward from there. Okay. Well, Cody, I first want to chat with you a little bit about the concept of objective-based skiing and kind of what your thoughts are surrounding it as someone who's devoted so much time to chasing down these 50 classic ski descents. Yeah, so I'd say there's there's two styles of backcountry skiing, and the one is more related to free ride skiing. Um, it's a philosophy that I have kind of enjoy the most and I think is the safest is to you ski with the mountains, let you ski, you dictate every single one of your terrain decisions, every single one of your line decisions for the day, everything you do is dictated by the mountain, the line and the, uh, the snowpack that you are dealing with. And you are just moving with what the mountains are telling you to move. Objective based skiing is much more like X peak is somewhere on my list, just like I've made these 50 classics on my list. And you are focused on skiing just that. And uh, the amazing thing with objective-based skiing is that it challenges you. It makes you focus. It makes you learn. Um, it requires patience, timing, and learning in order to tick it off. But there can be trappings with objective-based skiing because of the fact that if you have this big goal, you might start to ignore some of the warning signs. You might start to ignore 
some of the other better decisions that day because your eyes and your mind is set on that peak or that line. Um, it's a double-edged sword, objective-based skiing. One, the work that goes into it, I think is incredibly fulfilling and rewarding, but two, there's trappings that can make it much more dangerous. So um, obviously I've based my last five years on solely on objective-based skiing, um, but previous to that, you know, being a free rider and a backcountry skier, like talking to friends about this, it was like you looking at, they would look at me like I was crazy because it's like a, a very dangerous thing as opposed to the way that we typically go out there, which is you kind of see what's happening with the snow. You see what's the avalanche forecast is happening with the weather forecast. And you start to make decisions for that day based upon the, that knowledge. So um, those are, that's like the two major philosophies of, of backcountry skiing. Yeah. I think that's, that's the number one thing to keep in mind for me when I, you know, it's only natural for us to look at a mountain and say, I, I think I can ski that. Right. Yeah. Um, but you really got to make sure that you're not letting that drive overpower the, the pole that, you know, and the, the, when the mountains start telling you no. Right. <laughs> so I think, yeah. you, you know, like, uh, ski mountaineering, a lot of people ask me personally, what is the thing that you need to learn most? Or, you know, they think that like, oh, you get these ropes and these carabiners and anchors and ice axes, and suddenly it's ski mountaineering and learning all those tools is really important to the act of ski mountaineering and sure it is but a lot of that stuff you can learn in a day or two to me the single most important tool you can have in the mountains and in ski mountaineering is your mind and self-awareness figuring out how to make decisions figuring out where your own motivations lie where your own ego is where your own kind of your 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 feeling over the last couple of months whether you've been successful whether you've been not successful those kinds of things like that's far more important to me because making decisions is the hardest part of ski mountaineering. And it's the the thing that takes the most time, but it has the most consequence. Yeah, definitely. All right. So we've decided our objective. Um, let's get an onyx and take a look at it. Here it is. Okay. Cool. So So yeah, I already started. Oh, actually, it's over here. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. So awesome. So, you know, one of the why ways you, you can. I'm sorry. What? Why don't you circle kind of where Pyramid Peak in the line is? You can kind okay. of get people's eyes going. Cool. I'll get I'll get people a little more situated then. So Pyramid Peak is right here, um, and then the land <laughs> line, which is the 50 classic ski descent, runs down here. So this is nestled. This is the famous Maroon Bells, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen on postcards from Colorado. Um, and this, you know, these two, four, these three 14ers sit super close to each other, just, you know, in a really spectacular area. If you're ever in the Aspen area, go up there and it's like Disney World with how many people are up there looking at all these peaks and just taking in the majesty of them. So, um, so yeah, Cody, I think like the first thing when you are looking objective based skiing is kind of like what what time of year should I like even attempt to do one of these lines? Um, so like in what ways do you gather research in terms of like, okay, if I'm going to ski this in Colorado, like what, what steps would you plan to like start thinking of what time of year you want to go ride? Well, it's a, it's like a very complex kind of matrix of factors that you're thinking into it. Obviously, what most skiers know is springtime is generally a more stable time of year to ski steep, high elevation, exposed lines. Um, that doesn't matter what snowpack you're in, but it actually matters a ton even more for Colorado. Um, most people, I saw a lot of people in the chat from Colorado, those that are outside of it, know that it's generally a very unstable snowpack a majority of the year. But then you start to factor in things like what is the aspect of the Landry line? So we're turning straight to this and we know that um, that it's mainly it's pretty east facing and we could use you could throw in the filter of the, the aspect um, to get a better kind of view of it. So, yeah, we're looking at a lot of east, um, due east, some northeast, um, but so what I'm looking at that for is like, okay, we're generally working in the springtime and springtime 
these days as the spring skier, it's when we're starting to see melt free cycles. Um, we're starting to see melt free cycles earlier and early in the season. So it could be March. It could be all the way to May depends on the time of year. For me, I'm starting to want to see um, melt free cycles at a certain time of the year and start to look at it. It's like, okay, the snowpack is generally stabilizing. But then the other factor is when is it going to be too warm? Um, this being an East face, um, I know that right off the bat, you're like, if I'm going to be pushing into higher temperatures, highs in the fifties, um, into May, then my hazard is going to increase. So I'm looking for these windows of time, um, for that year, watching temperatures from afar, that is in this place where you're like, cool, we have cool enough temperatures during the day, low, you know, low to mid thirties, um, to below, well below freezing at night so that we're getting a solar kind of radiation that is like stabilizing the snowpack within a hard freeze at night. So, you know, if this was a, a due north line, yeah, you can end up pushing later in the year. But the fact that this is east makes me think like, okay, I want to get there to this line early in the spring melt freeze cycle. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, one of the features too that you can use at Onyx to just like get a little bit of history is our recent imagery layer. So I'm going to turn off the slope aspect. Um, this is a um, Onyx Backcountry Elite um, feature, this layer right here that I'm showing. So if you are interested, if you think this is cool, get that uh, get that $30 membership because um, this is definitely worth it. So the resolution is a lot lower. We're sourcing this imagery from a company called Planet. So it's less resolute than what we normally have for um, our standard layers. But what it does is it allows you, if you look down here, every two weeks, we take a picture of where the snow is and what the terrain looks like. So you can actually see like through, you know, the last couple months when there's been snow up there. And then even in the summer, if you're like into hiking 14ers, it's also no nice to know where there's not snow. So I'm going to jet back a little bit so we can see what like spring looked like. It's cool because you can actually see in the fall too, like colors changing in some of these areas too, the, the foliage. And these these shoulder seasons is where I found this recent imagery to be the best. Um, I was you know already looking kind of down in the Eastern Sierra uh, weeks ago before the first snow, seeing like, all right, where is there actually snow already? So then when we get our first storm, I know that I'm gonna, we're gonna be skiing snow on top of snow as opposed to rocks. Um, this feature is really, really awesome. Yeah, it's definitely, it definitely, as you can see, like is really useful in the middle of winter because it gets blown out as the, uh, yeah. as the snow just kind of settles in. Um, but yeah, as you can tell here, like, you know, just looking at this, like May, it's, it's kind of still in, but you know, as you start getting even to later May, like, cause it's not due North facing, like a lot of this lower elevation stuff is going to melt out fast. So yeah. That's one piece that I like to use just to get a lay of the land and to, and to totally. just see historically like when these when these things come out. So you can you can already see kind of the, my theory to this of uh, being that like oh yeah May that's too late it's too yeah. east facing and whatnot and it's like you're going to be walking in dirt you're going to be exposing yourself to really like extreme warming in the afternoon it's kind of like that early April style of line um, but you know again that's every year can be different yeah. And, you know, relying on like local knowledge and tapping in, like if you do an objective, just keeping an eye on the snowpack where you want to go is a good yeah. practice moving into a winter. There, uh, uh, there's been a, uh, I've gotten a lot of questions within the 50 of, uh, we don't put the dates um, very often on the day we skied it. And um, it's because to me, like they're, the date doesn't matter. It's the kind of the weather window that matters more. And so I don't want to lead people to believe like, hey, the first week of April, that's when you do the Landry line. That's what worked for us on that season um, in 2019. It could be three weeks later, depending on what the, the weather temperature is. It could be three weeks earlier compared, you know, on an extremely warm year. So it's, there's been a very conscious decision to not put dates in there to not mislead people into like, this is the exactly when you do it. Yeah. That's actually a pretty good, a pretty good piece there. <laughs> um, Sweet. Well, I think it's time that we start looking at like what the approach is, what we'll be getting ourselves into and, you know, ultimately like how many miles are we going? What's our elevation and all like that. So I think I'm going to start with getting all the adve best adventures started at the parking lot. So 
we'll jut over there. Um, so yeah, so if you're familiar with the um, Aspen area, this is um, Highlands over here. Here's the, the Highlands Peak, Highlands Bowl. Great place if you haven't skied there, you should definitely do it. And this road is the road that goes to the Maroon Bells. So if you've ever been up here to take the shuttle up to the Bells, let's let it load a little bit. This is the valley that you go through. So this road in the wintertime closes um, and you can either travel it via snowmobile, cross country ski. You can ski tour out there if you'd like to. Um, and you can also, um, you know, e-bike if the road is clear as well. So that's another part of the factor is like figuring out your approach as you're going to one of these zones. So Cody, for, for your 50 project approach, you used a snowmobile, right? To get, to get out here. Yeah, I believe most, a uh, lot of uh, Aspen locals use very cheap and very old snowmobiles because it's just road access. So you just uh, you drive out on the road five miles to save you that annoying, terrible skin trap or uh, um, cat road style skinning, which can take hours and eat into your day. Yeah. And I think like one of the pieces here too, is just to evaluate your distance for that. Like, cause I think it's like, yeah, we'll figure it out in a second, but it's, it would add a considerable amount of time to your tour if you were to skin along this road the whole time as well. So I'm going to use what we call the route builder tool. If you want to access that it's up here. And what this tool does really well is that it allows you to build a route um, via using a line and it'll give you your distance, your elevation, everything like that as you're going along. And it also allows you to like snap to existing roads or trails. So you don't have to kind of like guesstimate or lose some data based on the different points of like where, you know, where the road bends a little bit left or right. You know, you can always like add a little bit of distance when that isn't calculated correctly. So this is going to be our starting zone. Um, you can see this dotted blue or dotted purple line is actually um, notating the snowmobile track. So it's as easy as just clicking on where you want to start. And you can actually see my uh, thing is starting to, you know, cling to the road and, and to follow along all the bends and twists on this road here as I click along. So I'm just going to get a good estimate on how far out it is up here to the Maroon Lake campground, which is generally where the bus drops you off if you've ever been up to the bells. So we're just going to see that. I'm going to label this one as like snowmobile. So... We can see right here with just that simple, you know, input right there that we are going to be going about 5.6 miles. We're going to gain 1200 vertical feet. And, you know, when you're on the snowmobile trail, if you're considering snowmobiling or skinning, you have to realize like that would be an in end and out if you were to do it that way. So like that would add a considerable amount of distance and time to your already very strenuous day that you have ahead of you if you were to do it in a human powered format. So when we have this too, like what I'm going to be doing is we're, we're working through this is building this in a way that you could share with everybody. And I'll actually share all these points with the group as we go through here at the end. So I'm going to call this one the snowmobile and I'm going to create a new folder. This is my favorite way to organize um, all my content in Onyx, especially with particular missions, because it can get really overwhelming in your Onyx map if you don't do a good job like organizing and, and putting where your, your information is. So, and then I'll hit save. So we have this first part figured out um, and I wanted to give you guys a pop quiz. Like, are you exposed to any avalanches on that snowmobile ride in? Here, I'll, I'll turn on a layer for you. Looking at slope angle, right? So, okay, we're looking at the road. It doesn't look that steep, you know, there, the slope angle, there's not a lot of it. You know, there's not a lot of stuff that, you know, you're on, but look at all these avalanche paths on the side, right? So like you can actually see these um, and just see like, you know, if you're looking at even the satellite imagery, you can see evidence of avalanches. So going into it initially, like this is what our eights layer aims to solve. And I'll actually show you one area that is a good example of this. So, and again, with our eights layer, like we're still working on expanding it. So you're actually going to see where the eights layer cuts off right here. So this whole valley, you can actually see these evidence of these avalanche paths that go through here, but we, we don't have the coverage that extends all the way through this road yet. So we're working to continue to expand it. 
to be fully transparent, but you can see over here, this black area right here is a perfect example of, of an avalanche path that you will be crossing on the road with. And Cody, when you did this line back in the day, it was in 2019 and it was during that like once in 300 year avalanche cycle that we had in the area. And, you know, you were skinning through, you know, down trees and over avalanche debris through many of these different gullies as you were coming through here. Right. Yo, yeah, no, this was a, we, it was a weird thing because uh, Colorado went through this crazy cycle, uh, level five, extreme avalanche danger for a week. Um, I think it was making major and national news of crossing roads. And then all of a sudden, right after it went super stable, um, which was like uh, just a complete turnaround. And what we had, you know, we didn't have these kind of resources at the time. But using local knowledge, it was like going through, we started planning our route to go up this through a zone that wasn't exposed nor had gone through these class five avalanches. Um, we're, we'll kind of end up showing the route that we ended up taking to get up there. And it was interesting going through this, the the eight stuff and realizing we were like, oh, we went through where it was let, more simple terrain uh, to get our approach route. And yeah, it was a destruction that I've, you know, there was trees facing uphill both sides of the valley, meaning there was avalanches coming from each side of the valley and going up the other side of the valley and trees laying uphill on one side while on the opposite side. It, stepped, it felt like you were stepping into a war zone. Yeah, and that was my experience during that, um, during that avalanche cycle as well, was like seeing that for the first time and really putting, getting the fear put in me of like how big these avalanches actually can go. Um, and that's one of the things the eighth layer is, is aiming to bring more awareness of is, is really just like, there's a lot of recreation that occurs on this snowmobile road that we just mentioned. Like people will go out and snowshoe or cross country ski. And I think a lot of the times they don't even recognize that they are in avalanche terrain. Um, so that's, that's one of the main things that this eighth layer is going to look to solve. Um, and we'll go intermittently and show a couple more use cases of, of the eight layer right here um, as we yeah. go through this presentation. So, and what I'll say, and I, I'll say it right now, and I've been planning to kind of say this, and this goes back to our disclaimer of not being avalanche professionals, but this is stuff that has been handed down to me from professionals and mentors is that terrain management is everything. Um, you can ski on any given avalanche danger day. Um, which sounds like a very kind of ludicrous thing to say, because if it's high and extreme, we're generally taught to stay out of the mountains. And why I like to think about that isn't necessarily for the fact that you're like, oh, go out on extreme days, you'll be safe. No, it's more thinking of along the lines of terrain management is vitally important when you're out there. It, uh, reducing hazard, building margin on your up tracks and your down and your ski descents is how you can stay alive in avalanche terrain um you know when most of us ski on moderate and considerable days um we are often finding on the way up the path of least resistance but if you build in habits and think of your think of the way that like hey on if this was an extreme avalanche day where would I be going up the mountain? How would I be figuring out a route through this? Where would I stay away from? All those kinds of things is like really important to how you make decisions on any given day. I have zones in both my backyard and many areas where we go out on high to extreme days. And the reason we do that is because we know this terrain so well that we know there's no overhead hazard. Um, but that's through years of experience. That's through going into these places because it is your backyard so often that you know exactly where there is a risk and exposure. What AIDS is kind of doing is helping kind of accelerate that for a lot of people. So if you're going into new zones, you're not relying on local data. You're going into even your backyard zones that you're not super familiar with. You can start to see it. It's a cloudy day where you can't see up to the alpine. You know what's going to be above you. Um, it's a really cool tool. Um, I realize it's like quickly kind of accelerating just years of built up experience, and, uh, experience among mountain professionals. Yeah, it's definitely the layer I'm the most excited about. And we'll show some of the input layers as well. We have... Um an avalanche runout path layer, as well as a potential release area layer that we can kind of show. And those are complementary. We built them in like 
to use as inputs into our eights layer. But once you use them, like, and it'll help demystify like what the eights rating is showing you and, and like will help you put the pieces together of like why this stuff is classified as complex. Um, so Cody, we parked the sleds um, and now we need to start working towards our objective, which is, I'm trying to get a good angle without clipping it up, but there's the summit of pyramid up here. Um, so yeah, like what is your mind state in terms of like finding a safe path, um, and, an approach and starting to evaluate, like, how do you, how do you get to the top of this crazy 14,000 foot mountain? Well, just using without an eighth layer back in the day, I remember studying maps and you see from that red dot, how do you get up to pyramid? There's the route that you can see that is kind of off to the right that has a zigzag. Um, we decided to not go up that way because we saw even less potential hazard if you went straight up from that red dot through those trees. If you remained on that kind of tree line a little bit within that, um, it, even though that day we had like a super hard melt freeze cycle, nothing was going to slide. I am a big believer in habits and forming, um, kind of your general practice that you, you always go the safe route. Um, even though there might be an easier way, just always kind of continue to go what the, what the safe route is. Um, so we went straight up the, the edge of that avalanche path. Cause when I'm looking at this entire zone, what I see is like, obvious obvious avalanche paths big hourglass shaped avalanche paths on the left side on the right side and then you go over into the the right up track with the zigzags i see that going straight up through um avalanche terrain and what looks like very complex terrain and what complex terrain means is that there's a lot of potential start paths um, there's a lot of potential start parameters, whether that's rock ball, whether that's heating on rock, whether that's just heating in general, I see just a lot of complex terrain. So without this tool, but then looking at this route again, I realized like, yeah, that blue to our far left in the trees up into that green, that more simple kind of terrain was the right call. Like we were going up through less exposed avalanche terrain. Now you could have another argument um, for where we made our next decision to go up. But again, this is all kind of weighing a lot of complex factors like the time of year, uh, the avalanche forecast, the weather, the winds, all those kinds of things comes into these like complex decisions to make your way through the mountains in, in avalanche terrain. Yeah, and I think like it's really cool to see some of those decisions being validated with this tool in terms of just instead, you know, looking at this terrain and saying, okay, that is that is complex avalanche terrain versus that that's a little that's spooky over there. Oh, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that one, right? Like we actually have like a vocabulary now to to kind of like classify these different terrain types as we're working through them. So uh, and what I what the eights does too, and it like so as we're seeing here, like we know the color coding, the blue, the green, the red. But you can also tell just from looking at the 3D map, just looking at satellite imagery, it's like obvious avalanche paths, which aren't color coded, but it's like very noticeable. So it's like you're combining both of these things. So that the knowledge of like looking, although the up route that the, is the zigzag trail, um, that didn't necessarily go through what eights labeled as complex or extreme terrain. You can just tell that you're like, well, that's where obvious avalanches go. Um, we tend to make a joke quite often that, you know, you're in an avalanche zone and you see short two to three foot trees. And we all joke around of being like, why are these, these pygmy trees here? You know, it's a unique breed that only is grown right here. You're like, well, small trees and no trees is generally a very good sign that you are in an avalanche path. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So like Cody, as you're like looking, even we've decided that like these, tr this tree approach is probably our best bet. Do you get more granular? Like, would you flick on like a slope angle layer and just like look out for some of that micro terrain and the steeper terrain when you're planning your ascents in there or not, a, not in this terrain. Cause I would consider this part of the approach. And yeah. to me depends on, you know, we were doing it in the dark. We were doing it uh, when it was below freezing after a warm day. So it was those kind of things where you're, you're less worried about that, but we made kind of the, the general call that like, Hey, that's going to be a better route up and on, 
on just kind of average as opposed to looking into micro terrain. When I start to look into more aspects and micro terrain is more when we get into the serious stuff, which is the actual ski line itself. Nice. Cool. All right. So what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start mapping a route and Cody, you can let me know if I'm deviating, but this is again, where we parked the sleds. Um, I'm actually going to change the color. We can differentiate our lines. So we're going to call this the approach. And once again, I'm in that route builder tool. So there's two options within the route builder. If you were navigating on roads or trails, um, use that SAP2 feature. But once you start going rogue, you want to make sure it's clicked onto this point draw. And what that does is it unchains you from sticking to existing trails and it lets you kind of build your own route. So for here, I'm just kind of putting in like a little skin track. Um, you know, again, when you're in the field, like you want to look for these pockets of micro terrain and use your on the ground assessment when you're gaining these ridges. Um, and then, you know, we're going to work our way in the middle of this valley. We probably want to avoid the steeper sides on both of these that could put you in an avalanche path as we go up. And then I'm just going to pop to this little island over here, which I believe would be another key decision point um, as you're starting to gain what will be this couloir that we're going to go up. So Cody, like when you're hanging out, you know, you have eyes on a cool R, you haven't really had any beta from it. Like, what do you look for when you're looking at something for the first time and you're saying, we need, we need, we, we got to go up that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's funny if you guys are viewers of the 50 project, you'll notice like quite often where we're shooting video and there's only so much video when you're making, you know, kick turns and skinning up but you'll see quite often like there's hints into where we're about to transition into different types of terrain different types of decision making and like right where this red dot is is kind of where we started filming because we've got our eyes on what is above us called the banana coolar actually the banana is to the right i forget the this coolar that goes straight up and we are taking a, point, a break in a safe spot in this valley to then start to talk with each other. Like, I remember that morning right off the bat, it's been cold, the sun is just starting to come up. As you're looking at this coolar that you're about to boot pack up, you start to evaluate, like, what does that coolar look like? What is the right wall versus the left wall? Is there snow on it? Is it melted out? Does it look like it's going through a melt-free cycle? Um, just starting to tick pick up terrain clues. How much is it hourglass? How much terrain and snow is whole, held in the top of it? And then really feeling out like, what are the winds? Is it warmer than it should be this morning? Are we feeling like a, kind of those warm, what we like to call Zephyr winds, those like south winds? Is this going to warm too quickly? Are we already too late? These are those like key decision points in these like safe zones before you make the next step into more complex terrain. So I remember specifically we shot here and then we shot at the base while we were transitioning. And those are those times where like the camera comes out because we're actually all just discussing as a group, like what are our next steps and what are our evaluations? Um, and that morning in particular, I remember, you know, you see evidence of roller balls from the day before, but you feel the snow under your feet and you're like, this is frozen rock solid. We've got another hour before the sun even hits this we're good to go. Like the, there's no chance of this Goulart sliding or being a hazard to us. Um, so we're, we're heading on up. So let's head on up. <laughs> and again, like just to kind of give a little more context and like breaking into like what Cody and I have already looked at just based on the train, like I'm going to turn this eighth layer on just one more time. So you can see, like I mentioned earlier, we want to stay away from these hazards from the sides to avoid the runouts that could occur off stuff triggering up here. Um, but also acknowledge that like once we leave this island, it is the last time until we are down in the valley over here that we're going to be out of either challenging or extreme avalanche terrain based on the eighth scale. So this is the part where you really have to make sure that you're dialed, your crew's dialed, um, and that you're timing it right. Because, you know, once once you start going a little higher, it's like this is this is kind of, you know, this is a key decision point that you need to make sure that you have um, ready to rock. So Cody, I'm gonna start putting it up the uh the cool R over here. Is this one right? Right at the middle? Yep. Uh, that's the one right to that high point. Nice. 
All right. And then here we are up on the ridge. So this is another point where we're going to have to make a decision. Um, and I'm actually going to flick it. The snow imagery is a little bit um, lower resolution. So I want to flick it over to the just the, the trail resolution. Um, a lot of people hike Pyramid Peak in the in the summertime as well. And you can just see how exposed and how defined, you know, and how narrow it is up here on this, on this face. So like Cody, once you're here, you've climbed one thing, it's a false summit. You have a long way to go. Like at what point here, like you, you check in with your crew again. Um, you know, what, what are your, what is your process when you've hit this part in, in the middle of a physical ex exhortation? Well, so that day in particular, um, we had a group of three. So it was myself, uh, cinematographer Bjarne Salen, and then local and the author of the Fifty Classic Ski Descents of North America, Penn Newhard. Um, Penn ended up, he'd been traveling with his kids for the last three months by prior doing one, his work and doing his, uh, I think, visits of colleges with his kids. So he ended up having some really bad back issues. And this was a key decision point. And so we grouped together and he was saying, like, I can't proceed. Um, he being a local, knowing this train super well. And then he was able to drop down off into this other side while we watched him. So he went down this route. Um, he bailed, um, which is generally, as you've kind of seen, not something I do very often. Um, but it was these kind of one of these decisions. We had radios among the crew. We all had our own individual um emergency beacons and he was a guy that had skied down this route probably 50 times before and we were able to have eyes on him so um he dropped away from the crew we kind of had to continue to move and move fast because the sun was starting to come up and as i kind of already said in the very beginning that warming is an issue on this face in particular because it's so east facing um and we knew the next stages were going to be very difficult and very complex and this is something that uh, uh, this trail, this route that is on here, um, that is the kind of thing where you need to make decisions um, while you're making your way up. Because to me, quite often skiers, we don't look at the mountains like alpinists and we need to look at the mountain like alpinists. Alpinists are always in search of high points. They're always in search of exposed very scary looking ridge lines. And though it feels scary because you have thousands of feet of air on each side of you, those high points are incredibly safe from any sort of hazard, especially avalanche hazard. And so that route in, in the eights, it was it's complex terrain. There's obviously serious exposure with a lot of cliffs below you, but you're crossing snowy loaded slopes. And I, I frequently see skiers just kind of go straight up the gut of things when there's an obvious high point kind of spine or a ridge line to go up. And for me, like there's a pretty defined route here that skiers have taken, but th what you want to focus on is staying on those high points. Like I can personally deal with exposure. Like it's actually pretty hard to fall off a snowy ridge line with crampons and ice axes. Plus, if you really wanted to, you could rope up for that and create protection. But what you kind of the thing you can't control is whether you're crossing an avalanche loaded slope and the whole thing comes down uh, on top of you. So at that point, we were looking at the route and deciding, like, we need to move fast. This is going to be slow um, because when you're on those exposed ridge lines, you're moving slow and we're going to stay as high as possible on that ridge line to get up to the summit. Yeah. So, like, with this too, um, you know, really just not like I often feel like this is when you're on these types of ridge lines, you got to read the mountain versus the map. So like this, this trail that I have, especially in this high point right now is more of a guide to help you figure out your distance and your elevation. Um, but I think, you know, if you're here, you shouldn't be on your phone, like being like, I think it's to the left. I think it's to the right. You should definitely be reading the mountain, um, with your eyes. So, uh, I'm going to call this one, the climb. And this is reflective of from we left, when we left the snowmobiles to up to the top of this peak. So, our total distance is 2.2 miles. Our total elevation gain is 4,489 feet. Um, so that is a considerable effort to get up there. And Cody, like, how do you go about like looking at this data, looking at your route and estimating like how long will it actually take you and your group to get to the summit of this mountain? Yeah, I think 
every backcountry skier out there should know what their vertical feet per hour rate is. Um, whether that's just simple skinning, whether that's cramp being on crampons or whether it's kind of complex uh, climbing. I think what it, like everyone should be time obsessed out there. Um, as you all know, I wear a watch at all times and I'm always kind of tracking exactly how much ground I'm covering. You should know your pace that you can sustain for one hour, your pace that you can sustain for three hours, your pace that you can sustain for eight hours and 20 hours. And then you factor that in. So for me, you know, like if I'm going hard and we're not filming and I'm just touring and it's pretty simple, yeah, I can do 2,500 feet an hour and I can do that for three to four hours. But on a day like to this, where you're like, okay, so 5,000 vertical feet, I can do th to the summit of that in two hours. But I have to factor in the fact that we're filming episodes and we're trying to share this with the world. That always is going to slow you down. Um, so already I'm going to lower it down. Um, then you know that, hey, we're going to be on complex kind of exposed ridgelines. We're going to have to do one, if not two transitions. Um, and being 5,000 vert, we're probably going to want to take like one break to grab some food and water. And so then all of a sudden you're kind of lowering it down going like, yeah, but let's call it like 1,500 feet an hour. That'll give us a good margin for error. And so then you break that down. Okay, 5,000 vertical feet uh off the top of my head uh yeah like you know three and a half four hours and then i'll just kind of work from there backwards to be like i want to be dropping in off a of east facing line with the temperature forecast for that day to be you know going above freezing at one o'clock i want to be dropping in at 9 a.m okay so we got to start the bottom at 5 a.m that's our good margin for getting up there so when you guys are out there just general ski touring, uh, always keep track of how much vert you're doing per hour. It's the best way to calculate it. I'd say general rule of thumb, 1,000 feet an hour is a very manageable pace for most experienced backcountry skiers. 2,000 feet an hour is for very advanced, very fit level. Um, and so if you're just basing that 1,000 to 2,000, um, you know, 1,000 feet per hour is like really manageable for a lot of people. And I actually like to do that because then it allows you time to have chats, make decisions, and just kind of like uh, do what we do, which is filming and, uh, and kind of more relax and enjoy the day as opposed to being like rushed and forcing it and making a narrow margin for air when it comes to timing. Yeah. And I think that's, that's like the really important point is just like figuring out your speed and your cruise speed and just kind of ironing that out because the windows can be very small, especially in the spring when you're looking at lines like this, where it was bulletproof ice when you woke up before the sun came up and now you're chasing it and you're seeing evidence of warming. And, you know, the avalanche report has said that wet slabs are uh, one of the problems for the day as things heat up and start to shed. So, all right. So we have our, Climb figured out. I've added to the folder. Um, so let's talk about the descent, the fun part, right? What's yeah, there? totally. <laughs> um, I think you guys might have remembered I broke my boot at the top and had to heli strap it together, which was exciting. Um, there's not too much to know about the descent in general that like Onyx or the mapping could kind of tell you, other than what I've already told you as far as the general aspects and the general pitches. Uh, but one thing I'll just kind of say that there's a general piece of advice. And if you watch the episode, you'll notice it that again, high points are where we're often filming and take, cause we're taking breaks because high points are safe places. And then if there are no high points and you can see when we get through this exit coulard, which is an extremely exposed exit coulard. Um, if you were to get slid through that exit coulard, you go off a 500 foot cliff. It is a place of no fall zone and having ultimate confidence in the, the snowpack. As we got through that, we moved through it fast to try and get out of there. Um, the next place you want to be is under kind of overhangs, under safe spots that are under kind of big, tall rocks. Whether there's small rock fall, it's going to go over you. Um, whether there's small slides, they'll hopefully go over you as well. And you can see in that episode in general, we see a couple big boulders tumbling off, um, I believe, kind of that north uh, face of kind of south pyramid um 
And we were witnessing that, but while in a safe spot. And then the quick move that we need to do is get into that apron and get through that apron and down to a safe spot as quick as possible. So you're often moving point to point, safe spot to safe spot. And safe spots are high points and or underneath cliffs. Um, you can kind of see through this, um, which, you know, that list said it was 45 plus and it definitely was 45 plus. And our goal, I think the first time we really reconvened after being under there was as we got into that green zone um, down low. Um, we got into some trees. We got into an area where we finally felt kind of safe. And then we can talk to the camera again. Um, it's off, you know, often we talk about that in some of the other episodes where I'm like, we're not going to be filming that much. And you kind of rush through a descent. And that's because we're trying to rush through it and not take, we're not, there's no safe spot. So we're not going to stand there and tell you what's going on while being in a dangerous position. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, this one actually has, you know, we have the route here in Onyx. So I'm actually not going to mark this up with like, one of our routes, but yeah. And again, like you can see that this route is also kind of like, you know, it's, it's a general thing. So like, as you're going through, like you need to know exactly where you're supposed to be and, and use your, use your vision versus following your phone. Not that you'd have your phone out on this, uh, the steep descent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was um, all research you do by, beforehand. <laughs> yeah. And like, just again, we'll flick on the eights layer just to show you like this whole zone as we could expect is um, extreme terrain into and into complex terrain and you know even as we get down to the bottom of this valley like you know even here you're still in pretty 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 consequential terrain because of the overhead hazard um so you're really not out of the woods until maybe right here where you can transition into this like simple terrain over here um so but then if, we can get into the next little feature of onyx and kind of why to the point I say it so often in the episodes of being like you, the adventure is never over until you're the car. But if we do the avalanche run out um, yeah. uh, filter, this was what was really fascinating about that time. Obviously, we had the last five avalanches um, going through uh, the Colorado area that year in 2019. Um, and we saw, you know, class five avalanches are taking out heavily old, old, heavily wooded and old growth, creating new avalanche paths. But it was the kind of place you do not want to be. But what it was interesting is like when you are coming out of pyramid and when you put out this avalanche run out tool, you know, by looking at it, you're not safe. Like you're done with the line. You feel like you're like, we triumphed, but it isn't until you pretty much get back to the car that you are actually safe um in this instance seeing avalanches that came across both sides and going up running up each side is that kind of awareness that like yeah sure we wouldn't be going out there in a class on an extreme day but it's also that knowledge that like hey when you get done with that line there's a lot of east and south aspects that are going to be hanging above you and that avalanche run out shows that you have potential for avalanche to hit you um being that it's like in the lower to moderate kind of side, but it's still a chance. So don't just sit down at the bottom of your line and have a picnic and decide to ski out. Like you got to, you got hazard to deal with. Um, that's again, one of these tools. Like I didn't know going into the exit that, oh my God, you're an avalanche train for that long. Uh, so I remember getting to the bottom and seeing evidence of avalanches are like, let's keep moving and let's keep moving fast. Yeah, and just to take a step back, because we haven't turned this layer on yet during this presentation, um, this is our avalanche runout layer. It was designed in tandem with our eights layer as one of the inputs. So what this does is it shows you a little more granular, like where an avalanche could run. So the the hotter the color, you know, the, the reds, the oranges, the yellows are the higher probability where the blues are the lower probability. So you can see like directly under, like among these and underneath these cliffs, if something triggers there, it's a high likelihood that it's going to hit you if you're in these areas, whereas these are bigger, more, you know, like it would, it would be a pretty large slide and it would have to come, travel a lot of distance to impact you. But I mean, that year that you were out there, Cody was, was when we saw all of the things that could possibly go, go as big as they could go. So <laughs> it can happen. Um, and, you know, you just really need to keep that in consideration, especially as we've already determined that this line was pretty East facing. 
And this whole valley out here is also east facing. So that's been sitting in the sun all day as you've been climbing this mountain and descending over here. So, you know, this is going to warm up. And if, if wet, wet slab avalanches are your problem, like these mountains are going to start shedding as it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, and you could potentially be in a slide path. Um, so I'm actually going to get the wrap builder out one more time. We're going to discuss getting back to the car, right? So, you know, and again, like this is super important, just figuring out like, okay, you're going to be exhausted after hiking a 14er and skiing down it and white knuckling the whole time. Um, so, so sweet. And yeah, like we determined that our sleds would be parked over here. Um, so one of the other things too, is just making sure that you're keeping an eye on an a on avalanche paths as you go through here. And this is one that actually stood out to me as I was looking at this was just like, look, looking at the eights layer and saying, all right, well, we're going to follow this trail back so we can get back on the road. But maybe when we get here, instead of crossing directly underneath this avalanche path, which you can actually see like some of that in the in the satellite imagery, like the evidence of it, instead of going this way, we can actually cut back over to the road to get back to our snow machines. And that'll be your exit. And then hopefully once you get back there, your snow pony is waiting for you and you can um, cruise back into Aspen and drink champagne or whatever else the people with money do over there. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to make sure this is in the folder and bingo. So that is, yeah, unless you have anything else to add, Cody, that's kind of the, the, how to plan a tour with Thonix using eights, using your brain, using, um, the route builder, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's more more to add. Other than moving through backcountry is just uh, it's a matrix of decisions. It's a matrix of figuring out um, weather, avalanche forecast, snow history, snow that day, terrain, and like obviously, I kind of said before, terrain to me is the most important thing. But you still have to factor in so many other ways, and using mapping tools just like helps me plan that much more. I think the biggest thing I did use it for is aspects and using, you know, plotting routes and being like, Hey, how long is this going to take? What time do I need to start at? Um, that's really like one of the, the biggest tools I do being like, all right, we, the snow line is here and we've got 6,000 vertical feet. We want to be up there because it's a warm day early. How long is it? How long are we going to, you know, is it going to take to get to the summit? Um, it's really, really nice features to have. Sweet. Um, I'm going to do really quickly just a walkthrough of like how to get your phone ready for use in the field. Since I know a lot of you, like we've been using the web map the whole time. This is my favorite way to plan as you're, um, you know, sitting at your house. Um, but once you're in the field, you're going to need your phone to be there to, oh, I put the wrong link in. I'm going to, I'm going to fix that in a second here, here. All right, here it is. Let's try this again. Thanks chat for keeping me on my toes. All right, I'm going to put this in the chat and then I'm going to go on my mobile device. Cool. All right, and then I'm going to screen share this. I hope this works. <laughs> All right, can you see my phone? Got it. Cool. All right. So one of the cool things I like most about Onyx is that when you're logged into your Onyx Backcountry account, your data just syncs between your devices. So you can see the route that I built is just on my phone. Um, I didn't need to move GPX files to get it over here. I didn't need to remember to move them over to my account. Um, and you know, I shared it with all my friends with that link text. Hopefully that one worked this time. Um, if not, I'll try to figure it out again as we go through here. But you know, here's our line. Here's everything we looked at. Um, you know, if you can click on these, you can see all of the different things that we built. And then the folder lives in this, I'll point it, my content section. So I like doing this too. This is one of my hacks is folder organization makes things like way easier to declutter. So one of the things I like to do is see this show only this folder on the map. Like I actually am just like filtering between, like I'm intentionally clicking on what things I want to show. So there isn't just a bunch of other clutter because 
you know, up at the Maroon Bells, it's like I've done backpacking trips. I've done day hikes. I've done a lot of stuff up there. And I just want to have my map uncluttered when I'm doing this experience. So I turned on only share this folder. And then everything is right here. So the number one thing you need to do and you need to remember to do before you leave the service is down here, there's one button that says offline maps. So you click on that and you want to start a new map. And once you're in there, it'll give you, um, you know, basically you want everything you want captured to be in this square. So for this objective, I want to have it as high resolution as possible. So I'm going to select this high versus medium or low. And then you can actually, if you zoom out using two fingers, you can encapsulate a larger area. So I'm going to go kind of big with it, just, just to make sure that I'm covering a bunch of these areas, the snowmobile runs, the maroon bells, everything like that. So when you hit next, you can name your maps. Like I can just call this one like maroon bells. And then you can save it. I'm in the process of saving a large map. So this is actually, I don't know if you caught that, but like it'll tell you how much data it'll actually take up. And because I went so big with such a high resolution map, it's going to be a 1.2 gig map. So it might take a second to load. So I should want a little smaller probably for the demo. But <laughs> um, so yeah, this is like absolutely critical when you're going offline because once you have this, all the layers will work offline. All of your tracks can be stored offline, everything like that. And while this is downloading, I'll just show a handful of other features that you'll find useful. So um, in the bottom right, we have the tracker. And what this does is when you click this thing on, it's going to start drawing like a breadcrumb behind you. So it'll keep track of your, your time, your distance, your elevation, and it'll draw a line that you can reference in the future. So like I am always, when I'm, especially when I'm exploring new areas, like you put your tracker on so you know where you've been and you know where you're going. Um, and then in the future, you can reference that track later on. So I always like turning this on when I go touring. And I will give the disclaimer that it does use more battery life than if you were not to use it. So factor that into your considerations for the tour. Um, and then also right here, if you ever get lost, what this does is it zooms directly to where you are. And if you click it twice, it'll even have like a, you know, little periscope that tells you like which direction you're facing. Um, I find this super useful. I feel like I get turned and around then, sometimes. <laughs> I think this got asked in the chat too. When you do hit the location, people ask what elevation you're at. It's up in the upper left corner, the uh, yeah. 6197 feet. So that's where it's not quite as obvious that it pops up, but that's how you exactly know where you're where you're at. Yeah. Thanks, Cody. Um sweet. I'm just gonna pretend like my map did offline download um, since it's almost there. But um I always like testing to make sure that my maps have actually downloaded when I'm out of service. So there's this go offline button. And if you click that, it basically simulates as if you're offline. Um and you can actually start. Oops, I shouldn't have done that because it paused my map, but I'll just go to a different area that I've downloaded before. Um, so you can actually see like this isn't using any cell service right now. Like this is straight pulling from what is downloaded on my phone. You can see it says offline on that top section over here. Um, but you know, even in these areas, like you can get pretty good visuals of like what the tree coverage is. Um, you can switch between your topo, your satellite, your hybrid maps, and then you can turn on all of your slope angle, slope aspect layers, et cetera. So all of this stuff will be with you and you can trust it when you're out of service. But I'm always obsessed with just making sure that you actually have the map downloaded before you go. Cause if you don't, it won't work. <laughs> And with that, I think that's the light demo. I'm sure we'll probably jump back in when you guys have questions, um, but we'll go from there. So since we're crushing in time right now, um, we're gonna go back into this. I'll share my screen one second. Okay. So one last shameless plug for our too good to be true sale, um, $5 for premium. That includes everything we showed except for the private lands layer, uh, a tool called Terrain X and the um, recent imagery layer. So if you just want to get the eights layer, you want to get all the other you know guidebook content, everything like that. And you don't want to spend $30 or the $100 an annual subscription for elite, um, get, get the premium. Um, but if you do want to get elite, this is definitely the best deal we're going to have. Um, for it that I can envision. So, um, and Lance, if you could drop that link in the chat one more time, I'm going to give you one last chance to enter to the giveaway to receive the Mammut airbag. I've seen a bunch of you have already figured out the form, which I'm very excited about because I had to build it. Um, and that means the UX that I created worked. 
So um, I'll give you a couple minutes. We're going to go into a Q&A and then we'll draw the winners of it live here um, very shortly. So um, we'll get that into the chat one more time. There it is. So last chance, fill it out now. Um, if you don't have an account, you can create one right there. You, you can do it for free. Everybody can enter if they have an account. So cool. All right. And then we're going to jump into some Q&A. Um, let's see. You guys want to start firing questions in the Q&A? start looking in there i haven't been in there uh, yet so <laughs> how all right we had a question about how long the um tracker can function before your phone dies that's really hard to answer because phones are very different um like in fact i just got a new iphone um versus a older iphone 11 and the battery life is already substantially better which is one of the reasons i actually wanted to upgrade so i can't give an exact number on that but like just be cognizant. Like I personally have used it for pretty long backpacking trips and, and getting pretty far out. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that it's definitely one of those things to just keep an eye on too, as you're going out and just making sure that it works. So, um, you can do the right, we have a question. Christopher. Yeah. I think that was what I was about to read. So we'll answer that one live. Perfect. Do you want to read it? Sure. Uh, Christopher Newman, uh, do you use Onyx to plan bailout oh shit routes down? If so, can you discuss approach to this? Um, so I never plan exact routes like that as like, hey, this is going to be our exit route. It's more like I look at routes and the mountains for so long that I almost try to memorize them from their satellite imagery to figure out what it is. And then what I ended up doing is like, having the off you know the uh, offline map downloaded is you can double check that well out in the field so yeah you are like in general looking for those kinds of things but i'm generally trying to feel like hey where what's the overall feel of this range what is the overall kind of ways that you can get in ways you can get out looking at it from 360 degrees from tons of different angles i like i spend a lot of time just looking at maps, looking at routes, especially when you're objective-based skiing. Um, so there's no, I don't, I don't try and be holding myself to like, hey, this is going to be our bailout route. More is just trying to get a, a overall z zone feel for it. Um, uh, you know, it's like this analogy. Uh, you know, there's the the cookbook versus being a chef. So you can, everyone can read directions and make five-star cuisine if you just follow exact directions but if anything goes wrong you'll have no idea what to do and so a chef knows what to do by just knowing what the ingredients are knowing exactly what goes into it when things go wrong how to pivot so that's why i like to take that kind of thoughts into the mountains is like you're not following directions go from point a to point b to point c point c it's like general like hey i need to know everything about this um so that i could figure it out on my own yeah, I think like I've been like even we we talked a little bit about the bailout that occurred when your party went up there too. It's just like yep. having like having those decision points too, I think is a really important thing and just saying like we will make a decision here whether we're going to continue or not. And I think like that's one of the things I love most about like using maps um in general is just like they've gotten so sophisticated that you're you can always plan ahead. And I think that's like, you know, a lot of times you should plan a bailout route or you should get more familiar with the areas. So you can say like, all right, if things going sideways, like what do we do? And I think that's equally important for like, if we get stranded out here, like how, how will we get out? Right. And that applies to backpacking and skiing and mountain biking and all the things as well. So, and having, having an offline map in your pocket to say, okay, I need, like, let's say you're on a mountain bike ride and you break your derailleur and you're like, all right, how far is it to the nearest road? Maybe I can get there and, you know, hitch, hitchhike out of here. Right. So Having having maps your disposal offline when you're out of service is just super powerful and can help you feel more confident when you're out there. Um, we had a question and a handful of questions about upgrading to Elite if they have premium. Um, I think on that form, I try to do this. If it doesn't work, um, I'm I'm sorry. But there's a one underneath the first two ones. It says already a premium subscriber. Like it should let you upgrade. And if it doesn't, um, our CX team is really awesome. Um, reach out to them. They will help figure out um, a solution for you. Um, thanks, Lance. And sorry that I'm probably going to send people emailing you guys tonight. <laughs> but yeah, like that would be really, really awesome. And I, I'm glad that you think Elite is cool enough that you want to upgrade because I think it's really cool too. 
I agree. I think the features in Elite are, yeah, they're kind of not comparable to a lot of other features out there in other apps. It's really, really good. Yeah, and the private lands layer has really changed the way I see the world. Um, yeah. It's funny how much I was backcountry skiing and not realizing that I was on mining claims, um, that I was on private land, that you know I was just in places that I had no awareness of of being on or out of a national forest. Um, and so it's really, especially if you look at Silverton, it's just like all mining claims. It's checkerboards everywhere. So, um, yeah. Um, we have one Could from have, Sam. You, the, you, uh, Matui's Petros. I, sorry, I'm okay. butchering. No, let's name. do that one. <laughs> Sam, I'll do you next. Okay. Uh, this question is for Cody. Recent imagery feature is awesome, and I'll definitely be upgrading to Elite. Um, I used to use Instagram geotags and hashtags for recent images, but they've changed how those are searchable, so they're no longer useful. Are there any other spots to check out recent imagery from boots on the ground rather than aerial? So, yeah, first thing first, like I actually knew that in Europe, uh, I heard more people than necessarily in America using hashtags and geotags to check for recent imagery, like hearing friends saying like, hey, how do you know to ski that line today? They're like, oh, well, so-and-so on Instagram shared that, which I find to be incredibly dangerous. Um, one, because... When you're looking at geotags and hashtags, you actually never know exactly when that was uploaded. Sure, it's a recent image, but like in the date that it was published, but you have no idea when it was actually published. Like I, I particularly always publish not Instagram quite often weeks and or years before uh, or after when it happens. So it's one of those things like, yeah, you can glean some image, uh, some information from it, but I don't find it as super reliable an resource. But for recent imagery, there's one other than this, uh, the the use in the app. Um, one of the resources I found to be the most useful is airport weather cams. So FAA, and this might be not applicable to Europe in particular, but in the US, like there's many, many tons of airports other than the major ones we fly into, and they all have webcams and weather cams. Finding webcams and weather cams, there's a lot of resources out there. There's sites where they kind of aggregate them all, where you can go in and look at kind of actual conditions that are happening right now. So for me personally, like Alaska, uh, where I am right now, uh, there is more airplanes than people up here. It's like most people get around by airplanes and there's hundreds if not thousands of small dirt for air, air, airports and they're always a webcam that the the air you know the pilots need to check and so i'll often look at what like weather data and then look at the webcam you look at a forecast and then look at like what's going on out there um so webcams are getting more and more plentiful search out webcams as much as you can It'd be cool if we could have like a search line, surf line type experience in the app. Totally. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> want to set I up do some cameras. <laughs> there's a company in Japan working on that right now. So maybe that's one thing in the future. Yeah. One thing that we do have, um, we've already shown the, um, we already showed the recent imagery, but the other thing we have in the app is snow tell stations, um, which basically what those are, they're set up by the department of agriculture to monitor snowpack for agricultural reasons. And backcountry skiers have latched onto those as like a way to get um, data in remote areas and on high up on mountain passes. So the pros of them is that when, when there's one really close to where you want to ski, it's awesome because it'll show you 24 hour snow, snow depth, temperatures, stuff like that. Some of them even have wind. Um, the cons are that, you know, they're not actually designed for us. So sometimes they're not actually where you want to ski. And in this example, there, there was one on Independence Pass. There was one like kind of almost in Crested Butte. And I was like, these aren't actually close enough to be representative of what we want to show in this webinar, but they're really awesome. And they're integrated really well within our um, guidebook content as well. Like they actually pop up with like the nearest hotel stations within those. So um, check them out. Um, Sam says, hi, Cody. I live in Colorado where we deal with a lot of persistent weak layer problems throughout the winter. How would you use Onyx to find low angle um, treed zones that you feel are safe to ski when avalanche dangers high? That's a great question. And that's where I feel like the eighth layer has become is one of the best things because first, what I'd be looking for is slope angle, um, 25 degrees and lower. 
not even playing in that 25 to 30. Like you really want to look for very low angle terrain. And then what you're really, really factoring in is overhead exposure, complex terrain, um, using that run out layer and using that, uh, the eights layer to really see like if, a class three, class four, class five avalanche gum, could it reach me where I'm at? And if you can answer that by looking at a map, um, confirming it with your eyes, um, and, you know, when you go to that area, then just like those are the places you want to go. And that could be a 300 foot hill um, that you lap five times, but you get to giggle and swivel your hips and have fun that like to me that is where these tools are becoming really really useful like we have learned these zones after years of experience now you can just like scan around your local area and go find it um the biggest question then is which no satellite imagery can, can really figure out is how tight the trees are and that's where you're just gonna have to kind of go out there and figure out hey can i ski through this um you know those are the kinds of the, the last question that you're gonna have to answer establish whether it's safe and then be like are these these kind of ski is, is the trees wide enough to to figure out that ski through and sam a great resource is beacon guidebooks light tours of colorado um, which that is exactly what that aims to solve is is to send out like to give you information on like safe low angle tours with minimal exposure um, we have them digitized in the Onyx Backcountry app, and you can see them around. But because they're actually all the way across the state, they show up a little bit differently in our product than like the Berthid or the Loveland ones. Um, so like out in the Aspen area, there's the Sugar Bowls, which is like side country right off of Buttermilk. I was up there fairly recently. It was awesome. And um, like Williams Peak and Shark Park, and even up on Independence Pass, they 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 feature some of those lines over there as well. So I would always recommend like buying a physical guidebook and complementing it with with the Onyx backcountry experience because it's just awesome having both. Um, and those tours are just awesome and all the way across the state. And they're a really, really, really good resource. And Beacon does a really good job too with their authors that they factor in the eights rating more on the traditional scale. So like if you're in our guidebook experience and you see the eights rating, which you can actually see in the discover experience when you're looking at all of our guidebook routes, um, that's actually derived from the guidebook author using the traditional methods versus our auto eights model. So it's really awesome to be working with Beacon and, and having them like we're just totally pushing on eights and and that whole complementary system for it. So um Gal, how is Onyx versus FatMap, for example, when you're flying to ski tour in Europe? So this is one where I'll give FatMap the um the the pro. So Onyx Backcountry is only in US and Canada right now. Um, and we haven't expanded into Europe. So we have like satellite imagery, um, but we don't have like slope angle, slope aspect. We don't have all the features you'll need to ski tour in Europe. So I'll be honest with it there. Um, we really want to expand, but what we want to do is make sure that we're giving the best experience we can in um, North America before we expand. Um, so, so yeah. And I would be like, don't be afraid to have multiple apps. I've used all the apps. Uh, these days I prefer Onyx. It's the one I frequently find myself. I can say within the first year of launching, it wasn't that, but these days like Onyx is to me the most user friendly. It's like has by far the most user, the best user interface. Um, it also has the best information out there. So like, but it, don't be afraid to like try out other apps as well. I find that the matrix of them can be very useful. I mean, my life is dedicated to backcountry skiing and skiing in general. So don't be afraid to have it out there. I just find these days Onyx is kind of doing the highest quality for North America. All right. We had a couple of product related questions. I'm going to jump into the app for since I realized I totally glossed over them in this presentation. So the first one is how do I see the guidebooks? So um, I'll show you that now. So we have, if you're up here in the web map, um, there's a similar button on the mobile device, but this is your activity selector. So you can be in hike mode, mountain bike mode, snow mode, or climb mode. And this will change the maps based on those activity modes. So like if you click this on, let's see if any bike trails show up. I think oh, here they are. So here's like snow mass, all the bike trails. Um, so it just basically like re-ups the content in the map. So to see the beacon guidebooks and, and the other guidebooks, you click on the snowflake icon. And then when you get over to this discover tab right here, um, which is right over here, you can start seeing all the different guidebooks we offer. So here's some of this one. This is one of the light tours. This is Shark Park. It's up by Rifle. 
Um, we have Silverton, Williams Peak. This is where I actually spend most of my time. Um, very awesome low angle terrain. Um, Marble, Crested Butte, Spring Creek, Sugar Bowls, which I mentioned earlier. Van Horn, Independence Pass. So it actually starts pulling in like what's closest to you and then moves out. So we have guidebook coverage in Washington, Oregon, Colorado, soon to be Montana. We have Taos in Santa Fe. Um, so yeah, we're just continuously working with guidebook authors to try to expand our coverage. And some of the other things you can see in here, right, is like, I'll go back up to Silverton because it's my favorite place. Um, but even like from the get-go, we're putting those signals right in your face, right? Like this pulls in the avalanche forecast for the zone saying it's moderate. And then here's the snow tell information that I was referencing earlier. So 14 inch base, um, with zero, zero 24 hour accumulation. Um, cause how many times too, have you shown up to a trailhead or you're in town and then you drive up to the mountains, you're like, oh wow, it actually snowed up here last night where it wasn't snowing in town or, you know, down in the front range or wherever you're based out of. Um, so yeah. And then here it is like, as you're in this guidebook, it pulls you to the area this is the Silverton zone. There's all these different, um, these different zones. And as you we were mentioning earlier, like looking for that, that low angle or like the simpler terrain, that's where this already pops out too, with these different zones. They're all classified by the, the eights ratings. So you can just go through here and just see like, all right, what kind of terrain are we looking to ride? Like if it's the avalanche changes high, you could go over here and look at some simple terrain. It will zoom you in and it'll bring you to some terrain that is, um, you know, a, a good recommendation for a high avalanche danger day. Um, and then the other one we had was questions about importing and exporting GPX files. Um, I, we, we do that. So I'll show you how. So like everything I built, like in the folder and everything I could share with earlier, um, you can basically import GPX files just like that. So in my content right here, and then you hit this import button and then you can use a KML or GPX file and you can import it right here. Um, and then my life hack for this too, is that I hit import map data as a new folder. So like, let's say you had like a whole, you know, you had a whole line built out or a whole bunch of Strava tracks you're putting in, you can put it in as a folder and just say like, Hey, this is my, this is my beta for, you know, this area. And then it automatically is categorized. So you don't have to manually do it in the future. Um, and then when it comes to exporting, um, let's see what I got. So yeah, exporting is, um, like the best way I like to do it is that I just will hit the select button. And like, if you're just like, okay, I wanted to share, like I want to download a GPX file with like these three lines, you can actually just click on them. It puts all this in and then you hit this export button down here and then you can export as a GPX or KML file. So um, yeah, you can move files in and out of Onyx pretty freely, which is great. And then one of the things with this too is like if you have like a Garmin watch or something like that, you can get a GPX file, you can build your route in Onyx, and then you can put it on your wrist because um, we don't actually support um, like smartwatch integrations at the moment. Um, cool. I'm going to answer like one more and then we're going to draw the winner for this backpack and then we're going to call it a night. Um, so let's find a good one. Um, I guess I want to end on this one. And Cody, you can answer this however you want. What's the mission after the 50? Oof. Um, well, Matt, you might actually know. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, I got four, three of the hardest ones left. So, um, you know, one of the biggest things that was the reason why a lot of the hardest ones are left is it's, I want very specific uh, training uh, experience and a long amount of time devoted to those hardest ones. So, uh, this winter, I'm going to be primarily putting a lot of focus in those three hardest ones and having two or three expeditions, and that's it. Um, May, June, um, focus all of my energy on that. So, you know, if there are lines that rarely ever get skied, um, you know, once or twice in history, I think they deserve that kind of respect. Um, and that's what I'm going to be generally focusing on this next year. Um, Mount St. Elias, University Peak, and uh, Mount Robson. So um, that's mainly where my mind is focused. What after the 50? I got ideas. There's a lot of cool stuff I still want to do in the mountains. And um, yeah, thank you guys all out there for watching and supporting it because it's, it's awesome. It allows me to keep doing it. All right. And I'm just teetering over here, putting together our spinny wheel of fortune for the winner. Give me one moment and we will all get to do this together, which is the most exciting part of the webinar. Um, 
Cool. All right. I'm going to reshare my screen. All right, everybody get excited. Here comes the big wheel. All right. Spinning the wheel. <clears throat> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Nicole, you win the backpack. I will. Uh, are you on? Here? <coughs> chat a you chat a woohoo in here if you want. If you're in here, um, so sweet. I'll shoot you an email um, after this, and we can get the backpack sent your way. Um, but on that note, thank you everyone for attending today. I hope you learned something. I know I did. Um, Cody, thank you so much. Lance, thank you for manning the chat. I know there was a lot of questions going on and everything like that. And um, stay tuned. <coughs> We're doing these basically monthly. Um, I'm going to try to tap in some great avalanche um, experts. This recording is going to be up on YouTube in the morning, so you can share it with your friends. Um, and yeah, everyone stay safe and have an awesome winter. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Cody. Thank See you. See you next time. See y'all.